Do hey Terrence. Okay, I guess we will go ahead. Since Hello. We don't is know what just... April is. So far, just us. It's been very quiet in the channel today, if you noticed. I've noticed most Slack sick channels aren't super, super active. Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> a lot of Man, people I know in the land of cloud native are involved with the protests in some way. Yeah, uh, that and like, I think mailing lists tend to be the primary form of communication. Yeah. As well. Um, anyway, uh, well, really, I, I honestly have to admit, that um, I don't pay a lot of attention to the mailing list. <laughs> I just know a lot of the CNCF communication seems to happen into the mailing list. So I think uh, I know with like at least the other SIG that I'm involved with is the app delivered SIG. So that's one bill pack. Yeah, up into. for this SIG, we just use the mailing list for announcements though. There's no real discussion. The, um, um, so, um, given that, if um, in the event that um, April does not show up, we'll just end up taking up the whole meeting for the whole end user requirement discussion. Um, so in the meantime, uh, because it's being recorded, let me do the obligatory stuff. Um, howdy, I, this is officially a meeting of the CNCF Governance Working Group. Um, this is being recorded for CNCF documentation purposes. Um, we are also subject to the CNCF code of conduct. And so everybody on this call promises to be a nice, responsible human being, at least while they're on this call. Um, the, um, I, and so that out of the way, um, we can discuss stuff. Do you, wait, did you used to work at Heroku? I still work at Heroku. Oh, you still work at Heroku? Yeah. Cool. Were you, were you there when Craig and Peter were there? Yes. Because they're both friends of mine, so. Your name does sound familiar, but I can't yeah. place why. I also... showed up in the office a number of times. Um, I used to be a uh, Postgres committer, so. Gotcha. The, um... Okay. So. Um... Do, 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 do. Mm -hmm. There is the notes. Feel free to add anything you want to that. Um, um, we will focus um, pretty much entirely on the end user stuff because it's you and me and punt on the other issues until next meeting or some other time. So um, now one of the things I'm going to preface this with is I actually kind of don't feel like the end user requirements is really a governance issue, but looking at it, there's no other good place for it to be, <laughs> you know? And since we are dealing with a bunch of the other titular requirements, it seems it's not really governance, but it's not really anything else either. Um, so it might as well be us. Um, but later on, somebody might decide that they actually are going to lay claim to the requirement. Um, I mean, if not you, then the TOC, I guess, is the fallback, right? Yeah, I know. And you never want stuff to originate in the TOC. It, it honestly, what you'll get is you will get an updated requirement that is equally confusing. Uh, this, so I guess as just for context, uh, I think you weren't at the last TOC meeting last week or something. I was not. Uh, I and so that Harry actually from the uh, app delivered SIG brought this up because it's like blocking their whatever recommendation on bill packs of like what they want to say uh, with regards to it for incubation. And yeah. uh, it came up in the meeting. Um, I think the thing that was kind of decided was like case by like basically very unsatisfactory, like case by case basis shrug question mark. Like, I guess I we'll see when those. it comes in. I mean, that, those are terrible because what that means is projects that have a project contributor who's on the TOC 
get okayed and, and projects that don't, don't. Um, which is not how we should be deciding things, but. Um, yeah, maybe maybe worth rewatching that like five minute segment or whatever from okay. the TSC. Um, but I, I, uh, I believe that was like kind of the conclusion, like it was brought up and there was some examples like, I know even for app delivery SIG, like this is a thing that uh, Cloud Events, which is an incubation project, uh, mm -hmm. uh, brought this up because it's, you know, an even more stringent requirement going into graduation, right? Um, of like, mm -hmm. what are end users? What what does that mean? It's like mostly a spec tools project uh, in that regards. Like, how do you consider what the end user should be? Um, yeah. Well, I guess, so I guess two questions that I have there is, I mean, number one, one of the problems I'm going through with the TOC in general is that we have this list of requirements for incubating and graduated, but not one of those, well, no, a couple of them do, but most of them have no rationale behind them as to why those things are requirements. And without the rationale, it's really hard to figure out how to judge these. Right, because like you have two possible definitions of end user, right? An end user could be specifically how this is sort of put on the CNCF website, but that's really for the end user council, which is companies that are not vendors as a company, right? But then you also potentially have this other definition, which could be um, you're an end user if your company is not in a position to ever have a product based on the project, if you follow me. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, which would be a second potential definition and not one we'd wanna use for the end user council, but potentially one we'd wanna use for an individual project. And without the TOC telling us what the rationale for the end user requirement is, then uh, I don't know if that's completely reasonable. Um, so like if we were to actually make the requirement of the end users just have to be companies that do not and are not likely to have a product that is in some way based on the project, then that would solve the problem for build packs and, and cloud events. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess my question is like, why is it problematic to have, like I get in certain cases where that's true, but like, like I, I think specific for build packs too, for me, it's just uh, when I think about end user, like the people we were most interested in initially of like targeting our people, that very much are producing products on top of the software that we're building. Not because we're making money off of that, but because like it has the largest breadth of impact right. or like of like kind of uh, reach. So like if for instance, uh, like Heroku for instance, right? Like has a PaaS that uses build packs as the way to build stuff for it. Like, and they may right. for sure like Heroku makes money yeah. off of that, right? But like um, I would personally count that as an end user, if you follow me. Yeah. They're not selling build pack. They're using build pack to build something and then selling that thing. Right? Yeah. It's just like if I'm General Motors, I'm not a Linux vendor. I'm using Linux to put it on the onboard system to sell a car. Um so um <clears throat> Um, yeah, I guess that distinction uh, is definitely not clear to me. Uh, well, so, so I think part of the, <clears throat> from my perspective, part of the problem here is the CNCF is trying to use the same definition for the end user council and for the end user requirement for projects. And I think personally, I think those two should be different. Because the purpose of the end user council is to have involvement in the CNCF by companies where the entire company is not a vendor. I can come up with a couple of possible rationales for the end user requirement. Um, 
Sorry, I'm trying to take notes at the same time I speak. Um, so rationale number one is obviously uh, potentially to push all of the individual projects to help build the end user council. Right, that's a possible goal of the CNCF, right? Obviously, end user involvement in the CNCF helps the entire CNCF and therefore individually all of its projects. And therefore the CNCF maybe wants a requirement to push projects to actively participate in this. Um, um, But another possible reason for that requirement is what I call avoiding the C++ problem. Like, I don't know if you ever did any C++. Uh, very limited, mostly in school, but not in a professional okay. context. So back during the peak era of C++, there was this international committee called the Object Management Group. Also colloquially known as Oh My God for lots of very good reasons. Um, and the object management group's job was to meet twice a year somewhere in the world and pass a bunch of C++ specs. And the way these specs work is a vendor would write a spec. They would get a couple of their partners to support it. They would shove it through and no one in the world would ever use that spec to ever write any actual code. Um, and that's the other possible rationale for the end user requirement, if you follow me, because the companies that are most heavily involved in the CNCF are vendors. And because the vendors often partner with each other, there is the possibility of creating basically shell projects. That is projects that are good for each company's marketing, even though nobody actually uses them. And the CNCF as an organization doesn't want to get in a position where they are promoting a bunch of shell projects because that harms the CNCF's brand and harms the brand of the individual of the actual projects that do have users. Do those companies also not use that project that they are putting in? Oh yeah. Um, I, I can't go into specifics because I work for a vendor, but let me sure. say I could name quite a number of projects created in the cloud native space that are used by nobody, including the company that originated them. So I, I guess like as a more concrete example, like uh, I know in our case, right, for Bill Packs, like I put down both of the two companies involved uh, as example end users, because we are using it in yeah. a context where like we, we are actually, we want to use the yeah. thing, the reason we're working on this is because we want to use the thing we're building, right? Uh, but right. we also wanted to work uh, kind of outside of just the scope of the two things, the two companies yeah. involved. Um, right. Are those like good examples of end users or do you not want to count end users that are basically founding members of that project? Well, I mean, the problem with say the originating company having internal end users is that anytime you're talking about a single company and we have this issue with the maintainer diversity thing also, that company can have a company-wide policy change and then erase support for the project. Um, the, um, however, um, the reason why I was going over those two possible rationales and why I really want the TOC to pick one of the two as the primary rationale is because which one is the primary rationale really makes a huge difference, right? If the primary rationale is to get more end users for the UC, then we have to stick to the definition for the end user council, right? And you have to find companies that are not software vendors who will say, yes, we're interested in this. Um, but if the goal is to avoid publishing empty specifications, then it's very different, right? Then VMware could be an end, not VMware, but then um, Red Hat could be an end user for cloud native build packs because we don't have anybody contributing to it, but we could use it, if you follow me. Right. Um, and so, you know, what the rationale is kind of makes a huge difference in, in how this is supposed to be implemented. 
Now, in the case of cloud native build packs, I don't see why you wouldn't have um, SI slash IC companies using it. I mean, because theoretically, anybody who develops containerized applications should be able to use it, right? Yeah. No requirement that it be a big company. You know, you could have a, um, as a matter of fact, I'll tell you from some of the existing projects, they've made use of end users that are really three-person consulting companies, but that's still considered legit as far as, you know, any of this is concerned. So Yeah, we listed one one company that uh, opened yeah. an RFC that I think is like in that vein where they are like three or four people maybe, and they are using it internally um, uh, as well. But uh, there's also, I guess like, because there's a distinction between like, like uh, Harry from the AppSec basically made us differentiate between end users uh, by, I guess like the end user council definition and like cloud vendors. So there's, I mean like a lot of interest from the majority of stuff tends to be like cloud vendors that are interested in adopting this. So like, um, yeah. for instance, like GitLab, right? Like they want to use build packs as a mechanism for people to be able to run, uh, get containerized stuff for CI, right? Like as right. an example, and that's why they're involved with the project. Like right. technically like they're a cloud vendor. So Google is also a cloud vendor. Microsoft's also a cloud vendor. Right. Roku, Salesforce cloud vendor, right? Like building a platform on top of it. So um, a lot of our people that we interact with tend to be that type of, at least in, at the stage of the project is now, like there definitely mm -hmm. are this other group of people, like you're saying, but they, it's hard for us, like, I guess, like find that information out. Or yeah. At least it has been so far. Yeah. Oh, uh, no, it's always, it's always difficult. I'll tell you, um, as somebody who ran a BSD license project for 17 years, um, <laughs> Figuring out who your users are. There's not only that, figuring out who your users are and then finding users who will let you publicly reference them. Right, yep. I mean, that was always a huge challenge because like, you know, because consultants talk to each other. Like we knew that, say, the Army and the Coast Guard were using Postgres, but that doesn't mean we were allowed to publish that information. Right. The, um, yeah. I mean, I know that even at Heroku, right? Like we're not allowed yeah. to talk about our customers unless they're on the marketing page. Yep. And you know, of like all these people that are using your product, but you can't say anything about yep. it. The, um, so yeah. Okay. So, but you see, so overall, I mean, like I, I think our next steps are to pressure the TOC to make a judgment call on what the primary goal of the end user requirement is because- And, and you wanted this for everything, not just- I, I wanna do it for everything, users, right? Because, because as I was saying, so right now we're arguing about the whole maintainer diversity thing is, and I have to say, look, we need to stop making these stupidly simple rules that makes the assumption that everything is black and white because in every single open source project is its own special snowflake. And we actually need guidelines more than we need rules. Um, because like, for example, if we say this is, if we say, um, like if we say the requirement is, the purpose of the CNCF's requirement is that projects should need um, users to participate in the end user council, then that's actually kind of a different requirement, if you follow me. Yeah. In which case, you could even say, hey, the requirement is actually to recruit a certain number of users for the end user council, not to publish them on your website, because that might actually be different. Right? Particularly, like, for example, say that one of my end users was a bank. I would actually have an easier time getting them to join the CNCF end user council than admitting publicly which software they actually used. Because a lot of the banks have policies not to ever disclose what specific software they use. Right. Because um, the CNCF is so big that it's just like, yeah, yeah, well. Yeah, or if the requirement is, hey, we want to avoid empty specs and show that projects have actual adoption before they advance, then there should be substitutes, right? It should be even, hey, this project can be used entirely by cloud vendors, but if you have five or more cloud vendors who have adopted it, 
then it clearly has industry-wide adoption and it's not going to go away tomorrow. And I do get a sense it is the, for the end user requirement, you know? Yeah, I do get the sense it is more likely the latter based on yeah. some of the conversations from the meeting yeah. last week, but yeah, it'd be good to get clarity. Yep. Um, so, and, you know, and then if we get clarity, we can proceed um, because I, it is harder for some projects than others. It most definitely is. Um, the, um, I mean, in the meantime, given that the TOC tends to take a long time to make decisions on anything, um, I would suggest trying to probe in your various community meetings and stuff to see if you can find some ICs or SIs because those count. Um, and if you can find three of those, then you've met the letter of the requirement. Um, and, 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 you know, we stop having to, we don't have to argue out the larger issue for cloud native build pack specifically to get passed. If you follow me. Yeah. So the, um, and it's interesting because there's also this distinction on cloud vendor because like, I would honestly not have considered Heroku a cloud vendor by the CNCF definition, just because, well, I don't know. Did, did cloud native build packs originate at Heroku? I thought it originated at VMware. Uh, it, cloud native, well, so build packs originated at Heroku uh, and cloud native build packs is built, uh, is a joint okay. effort between both uh, Heroku and Pivotal basically. Pivotal, who's now VMware, and Heroku, who's now Salesforce uh, through yeah. acquisitions, um, of like taking the things we learned over running this thing in production for nine years from different angles yeah. and trying to, we had kind of a fragmented build pack ecosystem. So it was like, we want one build pack ecosystem that's built around basically kind of containers and tooling and, and leveraging all that stuff versus our own like proprietary, really proprietary tarball slugs instead use container images and like build a, thing kind of with a new spec and a new thing kind of taking those ideas yeah. and bringing them forward and that was kind of the premise of it so we were both like co equally co-founding this project and that's how we got into sandbox um yeah uh, i don't know if that answers your question but yeah i don't know it's just well one of the things i was thinking about is is the sort of fuzzy line between cloud vendor and cloud service provider right right because if you were to take salesforce the parent company they're kind of not a cloud vendor, if you follow me. They use other people's cloud technology to supply a cloud service. Right. Because I'd like to give you an example of, of one that's all the way on the other end, right? That is nevertheless in the cloud business. Automatic with one T. Um, not automatic with two Ts, which is a cloud consulting company and therefore on the border. But automatic with one T is a company that allows you to use the cloud in order to do things with your vehicle. That is, they basically connect the cloud to the vehicle computer readout in a whole variety of cars. Um, that's definitely an end user though, right? They're never gonna have their own Kubernetes distribution or, you know, and it's highly unlikely they would ever sponsor a project to the CNCF. And then you get into some of these fuzzy things, right? Of well, okay, what about a comp if you have a company that never has sponsored a CNCF project, but potentially could someday in the future, where do they fall on it? Or if you have a company whose main business is something else entirely, right? General Motors could sponsor a CNCF project. I mean, they haven't, but technically they could. You could imagine there being a future in which they did. I don't know. The whole end user thing confuses me. Because there are things that are obvious, right? Red Hat is obviously a vendor. VMware is obviously a vendor, right? Um, but there's a whole bunch of companies in the middle where it's like, is this an end user or not? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess to me, like uh, most of this stuff comes from the app delivery sake of like telling me that these are vendors. And so that's kind of how I bucketed it. But uh, yeah. maybe part of even the end user thing is like, what is the definition of vendor? It probably also fits under it's yeah. worth clarifying what that is. Um, like uh, I basically split it up into end users, cloud vendors, and then the third category was like open source software projects because for instance, uh, there are open source software projects that obviously they're not a service or anything, right? Yeah. Like it's open source software that uses cloud native build packs as part of 
like they have support for cloud and bill packs as part of that project. Wait, wait. And it's like, so actually, hold on. Let me look at the requirements because I'm not sure that the end user requirement says company. And if it doesn't say company, then an open source project would count. And for that matter, if the open source project has a foundation, it would also count. But yeah, in, in that section, I basically just listed those three categories and put a bunch of things in there and basically left it up to the TOC or whatever to kind of make a decision kind of on that. Okay, the limitation there though, which would make it difficult with open source projects is um, used in production. Right. Um, which actually, believe it or not, it could, cloud native build packs could be used in production by an open source project. If the open source project is distributing their software via cloud native build packs, and the project itself is not staffed by a vendor company, then I would list that. So where it becomes sticky is if it's, if the cloud, if the open source project is staffed, is primarily staffed by a vendor company, right? Because you could say, hey, Fedora is, you know, releasing cloud native build packs for applications. Not that they are, but if they were, um, and um, then turn around and say, right, but right. Fedora is primarily staffed by Red Hat and Red Hat is a cloud vendor and therefore this doesn't count. Yeah, we definitely have some of that stuff with uh, VMware has a bunch of open source projects that use it, but they aren't the only ones. Um, yeah. I guess, is there a distinction between um, like a contributor who's like not part of the core team, but like is an actual contributor's project. So for instance, like Google uh, has open RFCs and has made patches to the project. Um, and we're trying to get them to be a contributor because uh, mm -hmm. they are pretty active uh, in it. Um, but they have projects that use it kind of independent from the people, I guess, that are actually running, that are actually contributing to uh, cloud native build packs, right? Like different yeah. parts of Google. Uh, like, so Scaffold, for instance, or KF uh, from Google's side, both yeah. uh, have cloud native build packs as part of their documentation. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, yeah, so, um, Okay, and you said you actually have to run now, yeah? Yeah. Um, okay. If it's helpful, I can link the due diligence doc to you. I don't, I don't know if that is helpful sure. or not. Um, but the, um, here is the. I mean, I think you're, all of the issues you're bringing up are are lack of clarity issues that yeah you know already kind of readily apparent when you read the requirements, because yeah you know. They give you listings of obvious examples of companies that fall clearly on one side of the line or the other. But there's a whole bunch of entities in the middle. Um, the, um, and again, the rationale matters, right? Because yeah. if it's the empty spec thing, then showing it had broad enough vendor support would also cover it. Um, yep. Okay. Um. Yeah, uh, I guess for next steps, is that uh, the SIG just talking to, or the governance working group talking yeah, with the TOC? Yeah, so I'm going to take this up with the TOC because I'm already pushing for clarification on a bunch of the other requirements. Because okay. I'm like, look, I'm about to write detailed guidelines for you guys on how to implement these requirements. But I can't do that if you won't explain why the requirements exist. Sure. Um, the, um, but the problem is that the requirements were not necessarily created by the current TOC and they don't actually know why they exist. And so they have to hash out from scratch. Sure. Make that decision. makes sense. Probably would help um, the next TOC if they had yeah. that information too. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so that's the next step for me is to take this to the TOC and start a discussion and ask, Hey, we need clarification here. Um, the next step for, um,
the next step for uh, you, I would say, the thing I would advise doing, because, again, that discussion may take a while in the, in the TOC, is, you know, do, don't just focus on the big companies. Look for smaller organizations that would qualify okay. as end users. Because if you can meet the letter of the requirement and you've met all of the other requirements, you'll probably get passed. Um, so um, the, um, and honestly, it's not even the letter of the requirement, right? If three completely independent SIs found the software useful, it's useful. It doesn't matter whether we're talking a three guy consulting shop or Unisys. Right? Right, right. Because honestly, Unisys may say we're using this, but they're only using it on one project. Whereas the three person I see might use it for 10 projects. So the, um, it's still legit. It still counts. And I, my general, my personal experience is consultants are a lot more willing to talk about what they do than, um, than more established companies often are who have a PR process, et cetera. Right. Makes sense. Okay. Well, well, th thanks for the advice. Oh, you're and welcome. Uh, let us know us. how it goes and you know how to communicate. And I'll let you know what happens with the TOC or you can just follow the TOC mailing list and the issue that we opened on governance WG. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Bye. And that's it for this meeting. Thanks all.